Okay, so let's start with what we've released recently, or rather this year. Um, it's been quite an exciting time. A lot of 2D tools that have been in the oven for a while are finally out. So we're really happy to share them with you. So nine slides, we'll start with five or six, right? Stuff that came out of five or six. Nine slides is a way of slicing sprites so that you can do kind of interesting filing with them. Uh, so you can prepare a sprite, slice it into nine sections, and then when you scale these, when you um, resize these on the screen, we tile the different sections with different rules, right? So I, G, and A, and C, the corners here, we keep them fixed, right? The edges get tiled along their axes, and then E, all the stuff in the middle, the kind of fill section, that just gets tiled in both directions. We also made some changes to the sprite editor window. So what you get when you bring a sprite into Unity is of course a sprite mesh, you get a mesh that contains it. Because the 2D in Unity is actually 3D, right? Like a lot of engines. Um, so when you do that, you want to have some control over defining what that mesh shape is. So we've made that a lot easier now. You can edit that outline, refine it as much as you want. Or you can make it like really big so that you don't have too many solid blocks, right? The reason you usually want to do something like this is to balance that trade-off between poly count and alpha overdraw, right? So you don't want too many alpha tests happening between overlapping polygons. <coughs> um, we did a lot of work with sorting. So um, we added a thing called sorting group component. Um, this helps you kind of organize your sprite renderers and say, hey, all of you sprite renderers in this one sorting group, render together, right? So we can control the way you render your uh, sprites. A good example of this, a good use case of this in games, is if you have a character like this, which is made up of different segments, right? And you want to sort those segments correctly, you generally want to have some control where you say, hey, this whole arm, I want to render that. And then the body, I want to render that separately. And then the arm at the back, I want to render that on a different group. And then, when they meet other zombies, they're not going to have their body parts going through each other, right? So how many of you have done this in 2D games and you've got this kind of sorting concern? Do you see this kind of thing at all? Yeah? Okay, cool. cool. So sorting is actually a big deal. There's, there's more to it than that. What if you have a lot of these guys all over your level and you want to make sure that the ones further back, right, or the ones higher up, rather, on the screen, get sorted further back, right? So this is a common use case in games, especially platformers. You're going to find that characters that are further up on the screen tend to get rendered behind those that are further down. Now, there may be other rules that you want to follow that have to do with this. So we created an axis distance sort. This means that you sort along an axis. So regardless of what other sorting you've got, if you've got this turned on, and you define what we call a custom uh, transparency, uh, transparency custom axis, then you basically say, okay, everything on the y-axis that is above gets sorted to the back, and then as you move forward, it sorts to the front. Cool. There have been a lot of cool changes in physics, 2D physics. Um, we added a contact API, so if you need more information about how colliders are actually um, interacting, the contact API tells you about those points of contact, what they are, where they are, what's happening at those points. Good example, a uh, good use case is maybe you're making a game where you fire a rocket at a spaceship, and <coughs> quite the contact between the rocket and the spaceship, you want to spawn an explosion. Right? Not on the rocket, not on the spaceship, but at the point of contact. So you can get that out of the contact here. Yeah. <coughs> the example at the top shows what we call a composite collider. So here we've got some polygon colliders, some polygon collider stuff on the wheels and the body of that truck. But when we put them together and we add a composite collider, we merge the whole thing. Right? So this actually reduces, uh, this actually simplifies the collision in many ways. And we'll see an example later on where we use it with the um, tile map. We also added an edge radius as well as distance feature. This allows you to do things like this, where you, <coughs> you push out the collision radius of the edges. Um, you may want to do this when the collision doesn't necessarily match the visuals. 
or when you want to do things like make collisions for rounded corners, but you don't want to define weird collision shapes around the corner. Distance will get you the closest distance between any two colliders. Cool. All of the uh, possible collision code in 2D was rewritten in SIMD, so we've got a really nice performance boost from that. So, yay. Okay. So now I want to start talking about the features that we're going to demo. Right, we're going to look at some of these. Um, how many of you do atlasing when you're when you're dealing with games? Anyone know what an atlas is? Yes. No. Two hands. Okay. I don't do this. If I do this, everyone will put up their hands. There we go. So, how many of you love packing tags in Unity? Anyone know what I'm talking about? Yeah. But no one loves them, right? Because they get messy, right? So, yeah, you've got a huge project, you've got loads of sprites, you're packing tag away, and you're like, oh, well, hang on, I need to change the way they are the group together. Oh, I need a few of them in one atlas, and then they share them over here, and it gets messy, it gets terrible. So with Sprite Atlas, what we wanted to do was to improve and hopefully supplant the Sprite Packer completely. Um, and the idea was to make it friendlier, faster, more versatile, right? So let's break that down. In what way is it friendlier, faster, and more versatile? Instead of simply writing a tag against a Sprite, now you create an asset, right? An Atlas asset. And when you have one of those, you can pack, you can just drag into them individual sprites. You can, you can add a whole texture, so all the sprites in that texture get packed. You can drag in a folder, right? A folder full of sprites. Maybe the way you're working in your office or in your team, you've got you know, level one sprites in folder level one, and you've got swamp and level swamp, right, in that folder. So you add those folders to the yeah. app. Now, one interesting thing about sprite atlases is that they don't actually get packed when you add them, when you add a folder, when you add these elements to them. They get packed at build time. So, as you change the contents of those folders, your your atlases will adapt accordingly. Right. So, you're just changing the content. Uh, you don't have to keep on changing the text. Uh, more control too. You can explicitly set the texture settings on each of those atlases. You can go, hey, I want this to be compressed this way. I want it to have point filtering. You can also decide how this atlas gets into your game because now you can do atlas off get sprite. Right? So you can pull a sprite out of an atlas and go, I want just this one. I want to do something with it. And you can make variants of these atlases as well. So if you're trying to do HDSD versions of your assets, this becomes really easy. Okay, so let's jump into the first demo of the day. Let's take a look at the Sprite Atlas. Very brief. Okay, I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see what I'm working on. So this scene doesn't actually have anything on it. I'm not going to be working in the scene. What I'd like to do here is create some Sprite Atlases and then pack some stuff, right? So we can see how that's done. So in Sprite Atlases, we're going to go to Create, and then if I scroll down, Sprite Atlas. Right, so we're just making an asset called Sprite Atlas. So let's call this one Atlas 1, and let's make a few copies of it. OK. Now what we can see is, immediately, Atlas 1 already has all of this stuff, right? You can set up the texture, you can make it read write enabled, filter mode, change the compression, all that kind of stuff. That's really nice. But what I want to do is show you how easy it is to pack things. So if you want to assign a sprite, so let's look at all this sushi I've got here. Let's put some sushi in there. Let's start with a single sprite. And then maybe another one here. Right, so I can drag those straight in. I've got two sprites. Now this is called Pack Preview because we're just taking a look at what the preview will look like. We're not actually packing it, but we're going to show you what that thing will look like when it's, uh, when it's packed. And here we are down here. We get a little preview, and we've got two of those sprites that we've just pulled out, and we're packing them. Right. <coughs> so for Atlas 2, I want to drag this entire texture in there. I want the whole texture. Let's preview that. 
Okay, so all five pieces of sushi got extracted from that and they got repacked as neatly as possible. Okay. And then last of all, at this free, let's say I may be adding more sushi later, right? This is my, gonna be my, my big sushi killer app. Everyone's going to love this and they're gonna expect more sushi in the future. So I need to be prepared for that. So I'm dragging, I'm dragging in an entire folder, so this is just sushi, and I do a tech preview, and there we are. All in, right? And as you change the contents of that folder, every time you do a pet preview, we can get an idea of what your atlases are going to look like. So this is quite neat. Okay. Next up is masking. So this is actually a really common thing in games, and uh, it's been requested for a long time, and we're really happy that it's out now that you can do masking with sprites. Um, and the general concept, for those of you who don't use masks or haven't used masks before, is you use, you define a sprite as a mask, right, to reveal or hide parts of another sprite or groups of other sprites, right? Um, and you can do this in interesting ways. Like here, for example, this green frame is masking Unity Chan as well as the background, and the two masks can go on top of each other, and that's fine, that just works. So let's take a look at a demo of the sprite mask. We're going to look at a simple one first, and then we'll jump into a, a slightly more advanced uh, example. <coughs> uh, not that yet. Okay, so this is Rory the Lion, and he's giving a thumbs up to everyone, but we want to put him in a circle, right? Um, we want to Find him inside a circle so that he's kind of framed. Right, we're going to try and frame this light. Okay, so how do we do this? So let's take a look at Rory. He's just got a sprite renderer, right? Nothing else. Oh, he's got some fun glasses as well. We'll come to that later. Um, he's also got this frame, right, that is currently behind him. Um, and if you look clearly inside the frame, it's just got a sprite renderer as well, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use all the sprite renderers that are the child of this game object frame mask. And we're going to use them as a mask, right? We're gonna use all of these sprites as a mask. So here we have the sprite mask component. We define the, the sprite that we want to use as a mask here, this is frame mask. Uh, you can set an alpha cutoff as well, this is like where that point is. In the, uh, in the alpha. And then, how do we get it to actually work? We go back to Rory and we look at the sprite renderer. And this is what's important, the mask interaction. So we're gonna change this to visible inside mask, All right? You can also do a visible outside mask if you want. Uh, and that will keep only the sections of Rory that are not in that mask. Okay, so if you are going to do, say, a mini map in a game and you wanted to trap it inside a inside a frame, this would be one way that you could do this. Um, and what's really fun about this is, of course, this is not uh, stuff, right? You can still move Rory around inside. That's a proper mask. Yeah. Cool. Now, what if you want to do something a little bit more complex with masks? Um, let's say we wanted to limit the effect of the mask to only certain sprites. And then maybe we'll add a couple of uh, visual effects that we want to mask as well. Okay, so let's look at what we refer to as scoped masks. Okay, so here's Rory again. This time he's got a pair of glasses on. And what we want to do is we want to prepare him for party time. So we're going to add some really cool um, swirls inside those glasses. Let's take a look at how we want to do that. So. Let's take a look at the sunglasses. First of all, you'll see that there's a pair of sunglasses, there's frames under that. The frames are just the sprite renderer for the, for the frame. And then we've got a mask on the right side, and we've got a mask on the left side. 
now. Let's turn on the texture that we want to <coughs> mask. Okay, so what we want to do is get the left side and the right side to be masked by different by different uh, masks, right? So what we do here, as you can see, this is a mask, and it will mask everything inside its group, right? That's the idea. And then we want this mask to mask everything inside that group. Now, if we turn them on, right, if we go to swell R and we say we want you to be visible inside masks, and we go to swell L and we do the same thing here, you'll notice that there's still an overlap. Oops, sorry. Can you see that there's still an overlap there? Where left swell is cutting into the right swell. I'll show you. Here it is. Yeah, you can see it in both frames. So what we need to do is use sorting groups. So sorting groups are very useful for again grouping renderers to make sure that they uh, get get rendered together. So the solution to this is to go into the swirl. Sorry, to go into the uh, sunglasses mask. We've added a sorting group here. Let's turn that on. And then we've added one here as well. Let's turn that off. And now we've got both sides marked within their own scope. Okay. Um, but this is not enough. We want to put stars in his eyes as well. So I'm going to add some half filters to them. Now I also want the particle system to be masked within the same group. So let's look at an improvement that we've made to the particle system to support this. So let's select both particle systems and we go into the uh, renderer. Yeah. And now you have masking for uh, particle systems as well. right? So I'm going to change that to visible inside mask. And if we zoom out, we see that Rory's got a nice pair of party specs. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, cool. Let's see. Okay, let's take a look at one more example um, for a feature that we released in 2017.1. And <coughs> that is the physics chip editor. And we're going to see this um, in the tile map as well later. So the physics shape editor um, works very much like the outline editor, except instead of drawing a hint for the uh, sprite mesh, what we're, draw what we're adding here is a hint for the polygon collider. Right? So when you've done this, uh, when you've added the right physics shape, and then you regenerate the collider, or you reset the collider, or you add one for the first time, it's going to pick up on that, and then it will generate the correct collider for you. So let's look at an example of this and how we would do it. Okay. So okay, so let's take a look at these uh, these three here. Okay. So if we look at that, you can imagine that if you were to run a simulation on that. This is the green, this green outline here is the collider, right? The polygon collider. Something's not quite right with that line next to the front, right? The thing that's been generated automatically, you know, it's made a best guess and that's what it is. So, okay, not so great. So what we need to do is go in there and do a manual fix, right? So what can we do? Let's find the sprite. So the sprite is this one here. Right, tree A. Let's go into tree A and click on the sprite editor. Okay. So this is the sprite editor. Um, we can do different things here. So the edit outline uh, feature is here, where you would edit the sprite outline. And then the edit physics trick, which is what we added in 2017.1. And to make this a bit clearer, I'm going to do this in alpha so you can see the points. 
So you can see why it got that strange physics shape. This is how it looks at the moment. <coughs> right? There's a lot of points there, more than we need probably. So let's um, let's go here. Uh, outline tolerance. So you can send this way up if you want and update it and get an even worse collider with way too many points. But the fit is good. Or you can turn it all the way down, update it, and then you get a very simple glider. And there just seems to be a little problem down here. So we're going to fix that. So what we can do is we can get right in here on these points and we can edit it. Right, so let's get rid of that one. We don't want that. Um, I'm not going to do the best job ever, but I will show you the general idea. And then I don't really care about the indentations on the leaves. That's kind of okay. I just want a general good fit. And then bring those together. There we go. Done. Right? So when you've made this change, you just hit apply. <coughs> and we go back out here. And what you need to do for it to be reflected in all of these trees throughout the level is we need to select all of them and just reset their collider, right? So we're going to go to Polygon Collider, Reset. Okay, so there we go. Nice defined collision shape. Um, and yeah, that's probably going to simulate a lot more better, a lot better than we than we uh, than it would have with that previous shape. Check that out. Yep, yeah. all good. That's what we call a super move. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, so the difference is that when you're editing it in a sprite, mm -hmm. we refer to it as a physics shape, right? So it's a hint to the to the collider about what kind of shape it should make. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't necessarily follow every vertex. Like if you've got a lot of them in a row, it will try to simplify that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's the idea. Sure. Actually, yeah. Um, does anyone have any questions at this point? Because I'm going to switch over to another another feature. Um, what do you do to the region operation? So the polygon collider 2D that generates um, collision on input, right? As it's added. Oh. Yeah. Um, we are looking at potentially making this a little bit simpler. Um, by adding something that will just automatically. Exactly. Yeah. So if you play with the nine slides, you know that it does that automatically, right? With the auto tiling. So this is something that we're considering. Yeah. One less click. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. <coughs> right. So let's go to. Coming soon, right? And this is coming really soon. Um, 2017.2 is the version that we will get this in. And this is Helm. So this is a tool for building kind of 2D grid-based games, right? Um, a lot of us who have been making games for a while will probably have seen tile methods in the past. Um, this is our take on it. Uh, there are some differences between this and the way you may have seen tile methods in other engines or uh, tile methods previously, uh, but it's still based on the idea of tiles. The main difference is that we have an intermediate asset called a tile in Unity that uh, has a reference to a sprite, and the reason we do that is we can then add stuff on top of that, like we can add tint, we can add a transform to the tile, um, we can do other things, right? Possibly attach game objects, this kind of stuff to a tile. <coughs> the idea was to simplify the workflow around um, tile based games and to get really nice uh, optimized rendering. So the tile maps will render as much as, much as possible, um, regardless of what you do with them. Now, the other reason we created the intermediate asset is that the entire system is accessible via custom tiles as well as custom brushes. And we're going to see examples of those today as well. Cool. So let me just show you. Uh, a very simple example of the tile map first and what the kind of workflows around it are, and then we'll look at 
mon réponse à PQ. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so I'm showing you this in 2017.2 beta. You can download this as well as the all of the assets that I'm showing here today. I'll give you links to all of it uh, at the end of the presentation. <coughs> so let's start by um, just making a look at a blank scene here. Um, I just want to show you how this has been set up. So the first thing to look at, if we look at the hierarchy, is we have a, we have one of these, we have a grid component. So this was added as part of the tile map. Um, so when you make a tile map in Unity, you get a grid as a parent object, and then tile maps that go on the back. And the reason for this is it's very common to want to have multiple layers, right? Multiple layers of tile maps. So what we're going to start with is this one, which is the grid. And you can define things like cell size, cell gap, cell chisel. Um, and then the children here is a tile map called floor. That has the actual tile map component on it, as well as the tile map renderer. Now, tile map renderers are like everything else in 2D. They have sorting, so you can organize them nicely. Um, they also have a mask interaction. So everything we saw just now with masks, you can do with tile map. Okay. Uh, so the floor is on layer zero, the wall is on uh, order layer one, and then as we keep going, you'll see okay, here we have a uh, box tile map, and that's on a different grid. Okay, I'm just going to remove some of these because we're supposed to do that later. Okay. <coughs> we'll see how all of that works. Probably. Okay. So now we look over at this section, which is the window that got added with the tile map, which is the tile palette. Okay. And to get the tile palette, you simply go to tile. Sorry, you go to window. Tile palette. And there it is, and it opens up that window. Okay. Is this one here? So let's say you have a bunch of sprites that you want to paint. So I'm going to go with these sprites here. Give it a bit. So all these sprites here. I could, of course, make a tile asset and then slowly add it, um, add the tiles, uh, add the sprites to the tile asset. Uh, but there's a better way of working, which is just selecting all the sprites that you want and then dragging them into the tile palette. And then it asks you, hey, where should I put this stuff? And you just go, okay, just put them here. That's fine. <coughs> Excuse me. There we go. And then I want to add a few more. So I'm going to go over here. And then we'll just drag that whole thing in. Let's do it one more time. Let's put some parts in there. Okay, so you can see you can get going pretty quickly, right? <coughs> so each one of these has been turned into a into a tile. Here are the tiles, right? This is the tile asset. It simply takes a sprite and a color and a collider type. And we'll look at the colliders later. <clears throat> so how do you paint? So you come over here to your tile palette and you choose a vector tile map. What do you want to paint to? What target that you want to paint to? And this is populated from the list of tile maps that you get in your scene. Right. So we want to go with uh, floor. And to paint, I simply pick up a tile here by left clicking, and then I come into the scene and I can just start painting. So that's quite nice. Um, if you can paint, you probably want to be able to erase as well. So I'm just holding down shift, which uh, does, the, does the erase operation. Or you can use the eraser tool. <coughs> the other thing we can do here is we can grab a bunch of tiles like that. And then we can paint with those. Right, that's good. 
Now, there's also a box fill tool here. So if I've got a bunch of tiles selected and I just want to fill this entire level up, I can do that as well. And it will tile them nicely according to how I pick them. Okay. So that's um, on the floor layer. I want to go to the walls layer now. There's the walls. And I'm going to pick these up. I'll just kind of start painting. Um, here I'm using a square, square brackets uh, shortcut to rotate the tile as I put it down. I'm going to grab these. Go. Okay, so now I've got a wall. That's kind of nice. And then I'm going to go to the plant layer and I'm going to put some of those down. So let's grab this guy. And we can just keep going. Right? So you can see the uh, tool is designed to be fairly um, quick to work with. And that is place. Right, got a little follow cam on this robot. So he's walking around the level. He can go behind some of these things. And he can also leave the level to do. Uh oh, it's all an illusion. Okay, so of course we're going to need a collider, right? There has to be some way that we can get that. Um, keep, the, keep the robot in his place. Robo hero, yeah. Okay, so let's open another scene uh, where I've already set up the level. And um, what I want to do here is I'm going to go into the walls. I'm only selecting the walls. And one way you can work with this to make sure you know what you're looking at is you can look at the focus modes here. So just make sure I've got the walls. Yep, so this will focus based on the tile map that you're on. So good. And then I'm on the right tile map. And then I want to go in here and I want to add a component to add collisions to it. Okay, so I'm going to go add component. And the component I'm looking for is Tile Map Collider 2D. Okay, so this is a special collider uh, just for the tile map. Once I've applied that, if we look over here at the level, and we put it in wireframe so you can see it, we've got colliders all around the edges. Now, how does it know to make colliders only on those sections of the tile? Anyone have an idea? What could it be? So if you look at the tiles, we'll see that they have a collider type of sprite. And if you have a collider type of sprite, that means that you can take advantage of our old friend, the physics shape. So the physics shape actually defines where we would get colliders uh, for each of these parts. Okay. So you can do this really neat uh, kind of collision for each tile. Cool. Okay, there's still too many, uh, there's too many tiles here, sorry, there's too many colliders. So what I want to do is I want to use the composite collider. Composite collider 2D. <coughs> and when you do that, you get an automatic rigid body 2D, which we're going to change into a static. And then we change the tile map collider to be used by composite. Okay, so the tile map collider is now completely consumed by the composite collider 2D. And what happens over here when I do that? Mm -hmm. If you look at that collision shape, it's not really neat. Everything's being reduced to a bunch of edge colliders, and that's going to be nice and efficient. Cool. What are we doing for time? Okay. Eight minutes. I have so much more to show. Okay. So let's look at uh, what else we've got. So with the tile maps, I want to show you a brief uh, example of the custom tiles. The tiles themselves can be coded, right? And if you wanted to do that yourself, um, if you're a programmer, it's fairly simple. Um, you just need to create a class that inherits from tile base, and then you do everything that would be required for that. Um, as the tile map goes out, we'll be adding a manual section on how to do that, so you'll be able to read what kind of methods need to be overridden to get the behavior that you're that you'd expect. Uh, these are all under the hood scriptable objects. So if you're used to dealing with scriptable objects, this will be no mystery. 
So let's take a look at some of those. Because we're a little short on time, I'll only show you a couple of them, and I'll give you links to explore the rest of them on your own time. <coughs> so let's look at scriptable times. Okay, let's say. <coughs> Okay, let's jump into a really cool one. So, terrain tile. So, the terrain tile, um, it has a kind of awareness of its neighbors, and based on what's next to it, if it has, say, the same tile next to it, or it has three of the same tile forming a T around it, then we change the sprite that gets displayed at that particular cell. Let's take a look at the tile asset. Sorry, the. Uh, <coughs> the tile asset here that we get from this. So if we look at this, right? So this is a tile, a custom tile that has been uh, derived from tile base. And we basically define a whole bunch of sprites and we display those sprites based on a rule, right? So if you look at the script, you can find out more about the rules. Um, there are a few good websites as well. We can find out more about how these work. But it's really fun to see in action. Let's just pick one of these and start painting. So that looks like it knows exactly what it's doing. And then you do a box fill over here and you can just make a room. And you can start filling out stuff really quickly. So if you've dealt with tiles like this before, this will be quite familiar. Right? Um, and now we've got this kind of uh, this kind of functionality in the tile map. That's cool. um, let's look at one more before we step away. Uh, animated tiles. Right, it's a common thing that you want in your games. So the way the animated tile works is there's a sequence of sprites, and then you define some speed and some start time. <coughs> and the start time is there so that you can offset um, the sprite, so maybe you want different flickering or different uh, offset timing for the uh, different animations in your scene. Let's go to animated tiles. Let's grab this waterfall tile and start placing it down. And then we'll grab this splash tile that goes underneath. And if I hit play, we immediately have the animated tile. Right? So if you combine that with the terrain tiles and the other tiles, um, you can quite rapidly start to. Uh, populate your world. Cool. Okay, <clears throat> let's take a look at the other extensible uh, aspect, which is uh, brushes. And to do that, I'm going to jump straight into um, a demo project that we released um, earlier in the year as part of the experimental preview for Fortama. And this is a project called RoboDash. So the idea with RoboDash was to try to see what we could do about making uh, life easy for a level designer. If you had like a hundred levels that you needed to design and someone made some really nice brushes and tiles for you, um, how could you do this, right? How could you make it really fun to design levels? Okay, so this is RoboDash. So the first thing I want to show you is that the default brush itself, the one that we've been using all along, can also be overridden. Uh, what we've done here is added a initialize scene method so that as you're about to get going with a blank scene, you can start um, you can start doing more than just you know having to create a lot of game objects. You can just go initialize scene and the scene gets started up for you. Right. So that's actually a brush that does all of that, right? So the brush figures out what's in the scene. It looks at the fact that you don't have any tile maps, so it creates everything that you see in the hierarchy, and then prepares the tile maps for painting. Cool. So then you come in here, and this is the default brush. Let's look at other brushes that have been made. So these are done by um, inheriting from Grid Brush Base. That's the base class of these, <coughs> and we'll include documentation on that as well. So we can look at the, uh, this is the level painter, level painter brush. If you go in here and start painting with that, see this is quite powerful. 
right? So similar to the other one, you can create all these rooms, but there's a small difference. What's actually happening here is that <coughs> it's painting to two tiles at once. Um, the example is not very good on this projector, but what's happening is it's painting to a floor tile map and a wall tile map at the same time, and it's tinting them as well. So that as you see a, a wall and floor meet, we do a little uh, darker tint on it so that it looks like there's some ambient occlusion. Um, one more brush. Now we're getting away from actual level layout, and we can start to design level challenges using brushes. This is called the laser brush. So by taking the laser brush and painting, you can place laser turrets there. So now we are doing this kind of thing. Right, and if I hit play, you can see that I just built this, right, with brushes. So you can imagine the designer's delight, right, at having all of these tools and being able to start playing with them. So suddenly populating 100 levels or whatever becomes a little bit more fun, a bit easier. Right, so there's a few brushes in here to play with. Uh, I probably won't have time to go into all of that now. Uh, it looks like we're coming to the end of the session. Uh, but I do want to leave you with some links. Okay, so very rapidly we went through all of this. Looked at Robodash. Uh, you might want to take a photo of this. You're going to need the 2017.2 beta. Um, and you can download uh, Robodash at this link. Um, in development, very rapidly, we're working on some organic spline-based layout tools. You may have seen previews of them in the past. Um, the idea is basically a spline-based level uh, authoring with uh, kind of tiling of, of sprites along those spines and then filling it up um, in a smart way. Uh, we're also bringing native Kaliko animation into Unity, so look forward to that. Um, as always, these are the further resources. Please uh, drop by at the Experimental Build uh, Forum. This is where you can find all the latest stuff that we're working on, as well as all the stuff that you saw today. This is a good uh, link to have. 2D extras and 2D tech demos. This is our GitHub for releasing kind of content to the world, right? Because the Power Map. Uh, it's an interesting tool, a very powerful tool, but without the content that you've seen today, some of these features may not be immediately obvious. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about our process, but I can, I can summarize this to basically, uh, we make things based on feedback from our community, and uh, that's everyone here today, right? So if you're on our forums, you're telling us what you need, what we're doing right, uh, what's working and what's not working, uh, that helps us make decisions about the future, right? Because we're not making a tool for ourselves. It's, we're not game developers, in fact, at Unity. Um, you are, and we want to make sure that we're providing you with the tools that you need. Cool. So what you can do, let us know what's working. Um, as we heard in the keynote today, sometimes you don't know when something's working until someone tells you, hey, actually, that's good, that's working. Um, so that's nice. Uh, what's missing? So it's working, but we want some cool extra features, please. Uh, what's broken? I know everyone already tells us that. That's, that's the easier thing to tell us. You can uh, file a bug, right? You can tell us on the forum. So that's really good. Don't stop. Um, what improvements and enhancements we need? And please, as much as possible, share your 2D dev workflows with us. We'd like to know what you're trying to do. The reason we built the tools the way we did is because we got feedback from the community, and this is what uh, people said they wanted. And finally, Keep making, making 2D games in Unity. Thank you guys. <laughs>